are to be thanked. So thank you very much. So um, I am a futurist. I'm probably the only non-educator on the stage today. And I didn't play one on TV. But I did write a book, and I'll refer to it. I'll call Shift Ed, A Call to Action to Transform K-12 through Education. And it's education that we're all about today. Um, and it must be transformed. One of the things I always say as a futurist is please park what you think reality is at the door. And reality for most people is what you've learned and experienced in your lifetime plus what's been passed on from your parents. And there's no way that you can stay in that reality and be able to fully not get into cognitive dissonance with my presentation. So just Park that aside, and I'll give you certain reminders through this presentation. So first, as a futurist, what I always do is I look to the past. I want to see the trend lines as they come into the present so I can project them into the future. So the first thing I want to do is take a quick look back. So this is the last 145 years of education. And what you will see, if you look at the, t basically, the simple way to look at this is in the last 140 years, the level of education around the world has tripled. In the United States, in 1875, the average level was a little more than four, fourth grade. And now we're a little less than 14. And you look at the others, and you can see that some of them are trending, like the, the blue one in Japan is trending more aggressively than ours. So sooner or later, as I know as a futurist, you project this to 2025, 20, 2030, and you'll see that some of these nations are going to go beyond us if the trends continue. So a couple of co comments about this. This is basically the Industrial Revolution. It basically, public education started with the Industrial Revolution. The other thing you need to know is around 1875 was the, the market penetration of telegraph. So prior to then, 150,000 years modern humanity. Prior to that point, we couldn't communicate unless we we're face to face. So it's only in the last 150 years that we can communicate face to face. An example is more people will listen to, say, Mozart in the next 24 hours than ever listened to him in his entire life because you had to be in the room. So public education, technology for communications is really only 150 years old. That's one one ten thousandth of one percent of the time that modern humanity has been on the planet. So now we take a look at the present. Not a very good story. This is from the United Nations. It's a compendium of all aspects of education. Not just test scores, but money spent and everything else. And as you can see, and, and the first time they did this was 1980. So this isn't comparisons on, on test scores. It's overall involvement, commitment, and quality outcome. So we were at five, and look what happened with the Great Recession. We went from nine to 27 in the world. Number one, anybody who's in education knows that's when the budget cutbacks came. I travel, I've probably spoken to a thousand school superintendents, 2011, 2012, budget cutbacks, budget cutbacks. And when I talk to higher ed, why are your tuition going up? Well, because government funding. So this is a pretty clear example of how money affects education. Now, this is a chart that's really interesting, somewhat complex. Uh, if you look at the top line, that's healthcare. So what this is, is in 2018 dollars, constant increase in wages in four lines. The highest is healthcare. We all know that. The next highest is higher ed. And then you have the green, which is the average wage of America over this time period of 50 years. And then you have red, which is K through 12. So a couple of points to make here. I think that the gap, so remember budgets cut, got to increase tuition. Now I traveled all around this country talking to CEOs during the Great Recession. The one thing they did was we got to cut costs, we got to do layoffs, we got to put it, 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 all, all costs on hold because we need to keep our customer base. What higher ed did was to keep their incomes going up so the gap between, uh, this, uh, between the yellow line and the green line is we in higher ed keep raising our wages, and yet the wages of the parents 
the green line are not going up. So one of the conclusions of this is the gap between the yellow line and the green line inevitably has to be one of the causes of the increase in student debt. And I hate to call this out, there's, president, there's university presidents in the room, but at a time where funding went down from the government, they went to the customer to pay the cost. And you know, I, I, I don't subscribe to the chronicle of higher ed, so anybody that does, if there ever was um, a headline that says, in reaction to government cutback in spending, higher ed is going to massive layoffs, putting salaries on hold, getting rid of tenure. I, don't, I didn't see that article, so if somebody saw that, send it to me. Because one of the realities here is, you know, and, and, and why is healthcare such a problem? Because people make more in healthcare on an ascending basis than the people who have to pay for it. So, the, so this is a cautionary note to higher ed that if, if, if the value of the expense is not necessarily worth it, people will start looking at that. Um, this is why Udacity, Singularity University, some of the online uh, companies uh, of higher ed, whether they're good or not, have come online. They've taken advantage of this gap. But the most outrageous thing on this column is look at this. In constant dollars for 50 years, K through 12 salaries have not gone up. I mean, that's just outrageous in this country. We all talk about education as the future, and yet the politicians will cut the budgets of education because we aren't as effective a lobbying as, say, the military industrial complex, right? So, so look at that. I mean, it, 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 it is, and, and we all know that people who, when you know, a lot of the funding comes from, from uh, real estate taxes, and we all know what happens. Oh, I'm not going to increase my real estate tax. So, so we have to come up with another way to fund education. The current system isn't working. You know, back in the late 60s and early 70s, there was that great bumper sticker that I'll try to paraphrase. Wouldn't it be great if teachers got all the money they wanted and the Air Force had to do a bake sale for every fighter pilot plane, <laughs> right? So this is just outrageous. So basically, higher ed, higher ed is forcing the green line to pay more and we're not helping K through 12. This is probably the mo one of the most embarrassing statistics as Americans that we need to face and we need to solve. So, now, um, people who know me know that I stand on the three great futures of the last center century, Alvin Toffler, Marshall McLuhan, and Buckminster Fuller. You're gonna hear a lot of Toffler here tonight because he is an absolute genius. So he wrote this in 2006, Revolutionary Wealth, and I put it in my 20, 2011 book, Shift Ed, A Call to Action for Transforming K through 12. So here's his metaphor. He's standing, a, a, a motorcycle cop is standing beside the highway called America. And, the, and he's doing a radar check of the speed of embracing of change. So that's the metaphor. So the fastest, going 100 miles an hour, is the company or business. They're the first to embrace change. They're, they are the definition of going 100 miles an hour, so they're the fastest moving institution in the United States or in the world. The second is civil society, NGOs, associations. They're going 90 miles an hour. In other words, they embrace technology not quite as fast as corporations, but they know they need to change, followed by 60 miles an hour, the American family, sorry that got out of line, um, 30 miles an hour, labor unions. Well, I'm pushing it, hold on. Bureaucracies and regulatory engines. So now you're starting to see a new way to look at the news you read, which is the speed of change. Of course companies have problems with regulatory. They're moving faster and regulatory is moving slower. Why does this affect education? Because 10 miles per hour is the America, American school system and five miles per hour is the NGO, right? So, so a way to think about this, in, in one hour, companies have gone 100 miles. And in that same time, education has gone 10 miles. So after one hour, companies, those that want to hire, are 90 miles ahead. 
compound that through the years and you realize why education is out of date because it's not keeping up. And the interesting thing is we're about ready to go into an impeachment process is the slowest is three miles per hour, right? <laughs> We go back to the institutions. So to me, this is a really good way to look at the United States. It explains the contrast between, gov between government and businesses, and it also explains why we have lost our way to some degree in education. Remember those first two charts I put up? One of the reasons we've gone down to 27 is that since we were leading the rest of the world in terms of education, we were very American-centric. So we wanted to make Americans smart. We wanted to get the high school degree to go to the factory to do the American dream. And that has resulted in an angry populace that has put the current president in power because of that fact that they were left behind. So now even more in a global economy, one of the things that all education in the United States has to do is prepare people for a global economy because that's the competition. Everything is going global. We are in the global stage of human evolution. We've gone from family to tribe to village to city to city state and, our own, and to nations, and our only remaining boundaries are planetary. All human problems are planetary now. Immigration, climate control, climate change, wealth inequality. So, on January 1st, 2010, I wrote a blog post that got retweeted and re recast more than any other post because on January 10, January 1st, 2010, excuse me, I'm dealing with this cold here, I called it the transformation decade and here's the definition of transformation, a change in nature, shape, shape character and form. And I, I was really happy that, that a lot of people liked the name, but I didn't realize what a great metaphor it was because this was the time that I was talking to hundreds perhaps a thousand CEOs a year was doing the whole CEO circuit. And I said, Madam CEO, Mr. CEO, if you're not in the business of changing the nature, shape, character, and form of your business, you may not have one by 2020. Physical retail. So, so that was really interesting and was a great metaphor. And in a way, education fell behind because we haven't transformed ourselves. This is the decade of the collapse of legacy thinking. As a futurist, when I travel the world, this is what I see, the collapse of legacy thinking. Legacy thinking is from the past. So in other words, think about how a rower moves forward, right? A rower can tell you where they've been, they can see the whole distance, but they have to look over their shoulder in the future, so we have to turn and face the future, right? So the, so the point is, is that legacy thinking is collapsing. Physical retail, education, Factories, production, manufacturing, everything is changing and it's a collapse. And another way of looking at that is that this decade is the first decade of 21st century thought. And that is why there's the collapse of legacy thinking. I'm not sure that you want, it. well, yeah, so raise your hand if you remember the 60s. Okay, that means you got through it, right? Okay, the 60s didn't begin in 1960. They began on November 22nd, 1963, assassination of President Kennedy, followed three months later by the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, followed three months later by the lies that resulted in the Tonkin resolution, the escalation of Vietnam. So what we remember of the 60s really started in 63 and 64. So future historians are going to look back and say this is when humanity started to think 21st century thought. If I say 20th century to you, 20th century, American century, century of science, century of World War, it largely began 1914 to 1918. Russian Revolution, industrialized war, general theory of relativity, the map of Europe as it is today, and very unfortunately the map of the Middle East that the French and the English put together in hotel rooms in London and Paris in 1918 about straight lines and right angles in the Middle East. So all the storylines of the last hundred years were set in place in the first, second, I mean, excuse me, the second decade of the last century. That is what's happening now. So that brings us to the 2020s. These are the big four forces of the 2020s. Almost any magnet, huge change in the next 10 years will go under one of these. The age of climate change, the age of intelligence, the reinvention of capitalism, democracy, and an emerging new global consciousness. Now I'm going to touch 
on the bottom three today relative to education. Climate change, in case you don't know, if, if you have members and you've signed up, you know that on Saturday, February 29th, we're going to have a leap year look at climate change. And, and my co-author of my book, The Spaceship Earth, is here, Tim Rummage, and he and I are programming this so that you're going to get in the morning, here's what it looks like, and in the afternoon for the first time, solutions on how we can face it. And then on April 25th, we're going to have the future of capitalism democracy. So these are the topics we're addressing. So the future. This is one of the best, it is the best quote about the future I've ever seen. I put it in the front of my first book and I managed to put it in every book since. We should try to be the parents of our future rather than the offspring of our past. Key point to educators, don't tell me what worked. Don't tell me it used to or this is the way we've done it. It doesn't work. Interestingly enough, this is a, a Spanish essayist who was writing to his countrymen after the British defeated the Spaniards. So he was writing to say, it's all right, the Spanish empire is over. It's what we do going forward. So there may be a metaphor for today for the United States of America. There's a slow delay in this clicker going on. So here's the single question. What does 21st century education look like? Everything else is execution to answering that question. We're in the first decade of 21st century thought. We've just exited. We're in the implementation stage. So what does 21st century education look like? That's the answer. That's the biggest answer. I say it to manufacturing. I'll say it to finance and all these. What does 21st century finance look like? What does 21st century manufacturing look like? So historical transformation. Now for something completely different. I mean, I'm a Monty Python fan, but it works, right? Question, this is, this is what I wrote in the book that came out in 2011 about K through 12. You have to question all existing structures, processes, measures, outcomes, and costs, K through 16. You have to, you have, why? why? Why is there a nine month school year from K through 12? Five years ago, I spoke to a, a collection of school um, superintendents in northern Indiana, and they had already gone to the four times 13 model, which is every 13 weeks, 10 weeks of school, three weeks of vacation. So you don't have the fall off the retention of the summer. And interestingly, what the school superintendent said, the biggest pushback was the parents because they couldn't send their kids off to summer camp for eight weeks or they had a family vacation. But, but you know, that's challenging. Why do we have grades where everyone's got to be the same age? Why do, we have to, why do we have to, why is it? Everything needs to be challenged. Pre-K and lifelong learning technically and disrupt and accelerate. This is definitely, technology is at the forefront of these two more than anything else. I'll talk about that. So we have to teach to the future and emphasize design and creativity. As you heard, I'm the futures and residents of the Ringling College of Art and Design. Why? Because the 19th century and the 20th century were left brain centuries and the 21st century is the right brain century. We have to infuse humanity into all the engineering magnificent things we did the last century. So there is not a problem in the world that doesn't have design or redesign at the center of the solution. Ask the right questions. Sorry for this delay. Live your questions now, and perhaps even without knowing it, you will live along some distant day into your answers. I'll put them all up since it's going slow. Technology and connectivity. The question is, how much do we infuse it, and what technology and what connectivity? Calendar and operations, I just talked about the curriculum. I'll come back to that. Learning and the brain. Here's something to think about. If we took all that we know and are learning from this golden age of neuroscience about the development of the brain from the first day of life to say the fifth or sixth birthday, and we took that knowledge of neuroscience and infused it into pre, pre-K, we could change this country in a lifetime, in a generation. So one of the themes here is how much is neuroscience being incorporated into education? 
learning the in infrastructure and the physical plant and preparing teachers. Problem I have with preparing teachers is who's preparing teachers? What's the average age and what's the demographic of the people who are teaching teachers? Probably baby boomers who have, or digital immigrants because digital natives, those born since 1998, were born into the digital landscape. Everybody here over the age of 40 or 50 is a digital immigrant. So if you never felt being an immigrant, you are. Because we learned all this digital stuff as an adult. There's a disconnect there. So, whoops. Sorry, now it's working. Innovation is out of date. Don't use the word, it's a 90s word. It's a 90s word. As this first came to me back in 2014, I gave this big speech in, in um, uh, Las Vegas, you know, 2,500 people, and then I went to the to trade show. We've all unfortunately been to trade shows, right? And I was walking down the path to Science and Books. We provide innovation solutions to, we provide innovation solutions to. So if everybody's innovating, nobody's innovating. It's like somebody says awesome all the time, right? Awesome, 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 right? There's good, there's nice, but it has to be awesome to be awesome, right? So it's the same thing, it becomes a meaningless word. Innovation is out of date in the shift age when it's all about transformation and disruption, right? People talk about Steve Jobs as an innovator. He wasn't an innovator, he was a disruptor. He did this. If he was an innovator, we would have had a Blackberry with a bigger screen. That's innovation back then, right? He disrupted. So education needs to be disrupted. Generations. Okay, put that up because that's a baby boom generation. <laughs> Talking about my generation, you know, the who, right? When I wrote the book Shift Ed, I came up with a new title for my generation. We're the bridge generation. We're the people that ascended into power and education. We're the people that ascended into teaching education. We're the people that ascended into the dominance part of, 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 of uh, education unions. So we've maintained education the way we remember it. 50s, 60s, 70s. Yeah, that's basically largely where it is today until recent innovations, right? So we're the bridge generation. It's time for us to get out of the way. Generation X, they are now leaving being parents of K through 12, just demographically. And then we have the millennials. I don't know what's going on with the clicker. Um, So the millennials are the emerging leaders. They're the ones. And the digital natives are basically, born since 1998, at least K through 12 in college, those are the students. So you wanna look at what, how baby boomers approach technology and how they think things should be taught relative to a whole new generation that has grown up with digital. So here's a point, I always say this. This is the most transformative device in human history, right? It has more computing power than the Cray supercomputers of the 70s and the 80s. The line cook on this campus has one of these. So the line cook on this campus has something that the richest man, the most powerful corporation 20 years ago didn't, didn't have. A handheld com supercomputer in their hands, right? I can go on about that, but, and that's about the greatest dissemination of, of computing power in human history. But what this did is it created two realities the physical reality based on atoms, and the screen reality based on digits. And because digits are more faster than atoms, I started saying in 2010, for example, physical retail is gonna collapse. Why? Because of something over here on the screen, the reality called Amazon.com or Uber or Airbnb, right? So now you have a generation, the, young, the, the youngest part of the millennials and all the digitalists who have lived their entire life in the dual reality of screen and physical. Like you're listening to David here in the physical reality, but you might be checking computers to see what your reality is outside this room. So understand that the generation that are the students going forward have a dual reality and they understand it. 50% of the reality is this, whether you like it or not. The baby boomers grew up with television. In the 50s, oh, it's the boob tube, it's gonna make people stupid. The average intelli IQ has gone up every year, since, every decade since then, why? Because it was a window to the world. So whenever there's a new technology, it always upsets the existing reality.
I, I, I came up with this in 2012, my book, Entering the Shift Edge, arbitrary somewhat. But the bottom line is, each of these generations right now in the United States is bigger than the baby boom is, and the millennials are bigger than the baby boom ever were. So these are the two biggest generations in American history. And the interesting thing is, as of about six months ago, the majority of the US. So if you were born since 1981, you're in the majority. So if you're born early in that, you're in the minority of the United States. And the future of education is the young and the emerging generations. So these two generations are the one, and it's a global trend. I think we're 37th. 50% of the people in Nigeria are under the age of 18. Two thirds of the people who live in India are under the age of 35. So it is a youth explosion, particularly in the, in the developing countries, but here, for climate change reasons, the decreasing population and birth rate is absolutely wonderful, but you'll hear about that on February 29th. But the point is, this is a global trend. Understand, if you're, if you're older, like I am, you're baby boomer, you go shopping on Amazon or you, you answer something about retirement, right? So for the next three weeks, you're gonna get ads about that, right? So we baby boomers have kind of insulated ourselves online because we don't, we're not going out and shopping for discotheques, right? We're talking, it may even be Depends or whatever it is. So we have this illusion that everybody's getting older. No, everybody's getting younger. And we're in this increasingly uh, bubble of technological re re reinforcing that, oh, it's an aging population. It's not an aging population, only in the old construct, and we'll talk about this in February, on April 25th, about the growth. You need to have birth to have GDP. That's what got us through the last century. It's no longer a valid concept. This is for everybody <laughs> under the age of 40. You get it, right? Anybody not get this, it's okay. It's a very pejorative term now, right? The millennials and the digital natives say, okay, boomer, get out of the way, right? If you think of the baby boom, you know, if you think about any generation, their power is from when they're 30 to say 60. So that means the influence of the baby boom was 1976 to roughly 2026. So what has happened? Oh, let's see, climate change, the horrible recession, endless war, wealth inequality, population explosion, homeless. That's on our generation's watch. So that's why, okay, boomer, enough already. Look what you gave to us. Okay. 1900, Easter morning, in front of the cathedral on Fifth Avenue in 1900, spot the automobile. There's one. 13 years later, 13 years later, I'm sorry, this was working perfectly yesterday, I got to point it. I just learned that. Okay. Spot the horse. So 13 years. It went from 100% horse to 100% car. So you'll see the dates up there. I'm about to talk about the technology that's coming online in the next 13 years. 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, the speed of change was maybe 100th what it is now. So if you accept history that in 13 years, New York City went basic, at least on Fifth Avenue, from entire horse to entire car, you have to accept whatever I'm about to present to you as being potentially valid, right? So now let's go back to this. What was the number one environmental hazard in 1900 if you lived in Manhattan? Anybody? Horse poop. Horse poop, right. So the solution for horse poop was a canvas bag and leather on the back of the horse so because it was 1900, they just drove it to the west side and dumped it into the Hudson, right? They didn't realize that the solution to horse poop was a new drivetrain, right? Think about that. So 
as Gretzky has always said, why are you the, answer is you know all this, but I'm going to say it for those of you who don't. Why are you the greatest hockey player of all time? Because I skate to where the, huck, the puck's going to be, right? So use this as an example. There's all this altruistic, really nice feel-good stuff that people are doing about teaching grade school girls to code. Right? You've probably heard of that. That's really nice because coding is a guysville place, right? So we need to get feminist driven. But it's the canvas bag. Because by the time they get out of high school, let alone college, computers are already self coding. Coding will no longer be an industry or profession in about five years. So it's a canvas bag. As a futurist, that's what always gets me. Oh, we're going to solve this problem by doing this. It's a present problem. We're going to solve it for the future, not realizing what else is going to happen in the future. My father worked his way to the University of Florida, 1929 to 1933. I grew up with this. I heard about this. I worked my way through college because I could type by typing the term papers of the rich kids. So you're going to learn to type. So right before my freshman year, I was sent, I had to type. I'm really glad I did. But by then, the only job available might be the typing pool. And I was getting eviscerated by um, the Selectric. Oh, by the way, there was this company called Xerox, which rendered carbon paper. So, so, in other words, don't think you can solve an existing problem by projecting the solution to it into the future by education, necessarily. So remember that. In 13 years, this happened. In 13 years, nobody who was getting horse poop on their feet knew that the solution was a new drivetrain. So what's the new drivetrain of the next 10 years? I'm going to show you. So the future is now. I love this quote from William Gibson. <laughs> That's right, I got a point. Um, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Interestingly enough, he coined the phrase cyberspace in 1981. He's a science fiction writer. Now he writes present day commentary because the future has caught up to his writing. Those of you who have heard me over the last couple of years, I feel like I'm a futurist, but I'm also a canary in the mind. We don't have time to talk about 2030 and 2040 because 2020s is going to determine the outcome of this century, right? So wake up, wake up. You'll see that in a couple of minutes. So ascendant technologies, nanotechnology, brain wave computer interface, early stage telepathy, BCI. It used to be BMI, brain machine interface. This is available in laboratories now. In other words, we started with typing. Then it was touch interface. Then it was voice, Siri, Alexa. Now it's going to be brainwave computer interface. We've got to think about that in our education. What is that going to do? Augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain. Not sure how blockchain is going to affect education, but it is going to affect every industry going forward. So we have to be thinking about blockchain. Maybe it's in the transfer of credits from college college to college, I don't know. And then implantable chips. There's 200,000 people in the United States today that have a chip implanted in their brain because they have Parkinson's. So they press a button on a device because we know where Parkinson's resides in the brain, it sends a signal and the symptoms go away. So as you see with some forecasts about implantable chips, how are implantable chips going to affect education. I'm not saying we have to answer that today or in the next year, but we have to understand that there are new drivetrains coming. So, whenever you look at the top 25 inventions in modern history, electricity is always number one. All the others need it, right? The interesting thing about electricity, if you think about it, is that it has transformed how humans live on the planet more than anything else. In other words, air conditioning allowed the sun belt. Electricity allowed something other than the stove in the kitchen. Electricity has created our ability to work through the night, time, whatever. But the AI, I'm calling it that for now, is going to be as big as electricity and how it affects how humans live on the planet.
Now the problem with that is that it's very difficult to see in the early stage. Like when you saw electricity, it was this flickering light. Oh wow, the only conclusion you could draw was that, oh, it's going to light up the dark so we can work or play through the night. We didn't see microwave ovens. We didn't see the air conditioning. So that all came as a consequence. So right now we're looking at artificial intelligence in the way, in the stupid way, there's robotic overlords and everything else, and, and, and we don't know what it's actually going to be. Just like in the beginning of electricity, we didn't know that it would do those things. Whoops. So it's very difficult to predict the outcome of this. The canvas bag metaphor. So most current conversations are from current, soon to be legacy thinking. So, in 2016, when AlphaGo happened, which is the single, if you don't know it, I don't have the time up here, but AlphaGo changed the game in early 2016, where Google AlphaGo beat the best Go player in the world. And the Go player, in move 37, in game three of five games, AlphaGo, the person who did the move, made the move. The number one Go player in the world sat down, looked at it, said, I want one of my timeouts, pushed his chair back, left the room. Now this was going on in a kind of a, a plexiglass cube with all the cognoscentes from around the world in Go, watching. And at the conclusion of that game, which AlphaGo won, it was, assumed, it was attributed to move 37. So, um, when asked, the world champion Go player, why did you push your chair back and ask for timeout? He said, because the computer made a completely intuitive move and I was unprepared for a computer to have intuition. Google later said, the number of potential moves in a Go game is equal to the number of atoms in the universe, an infinite number of moves. So you can't, like chess, computationally get ahead. And what Google also said was they introduced a random algorithm into the Go platform, into the Go program. So as of 2016, artificial intelligence has intuition. Back in, in, in 2013, I would say, as I guess lectured Ringling students, don't worry, you're creatives. You will always have jobs. Now, I say to them, you may want to be a computer animator, and you might be, but because you have come here and you've learned creative thinking, design thinking, you may be upper management of a Fortune 500 company because of what's going to go on with artificial intelligence. So, this is the definition of artificial. I'm swimming entirely upstream with what I'm about to say. It should not be called artificial intelligence. It should be called technological intelligence. Artificial intelligence was given the name in 1955 at a computer science meeting in Princeton. Because back then, computers were machines in their minds. So they called it artificial. The problem with that is other than the only time where artificial has been good in my life is when I was at a ski resort and there was no snow. Artificial snow, oh good, I can ski today. Anything else, it's negative, right? So by calling it artificial, we have a sub subliminal, sublinguistic way in our mind made it less than us. Which is why we have all these nervous reservations about it. It's not us. We're anthropomorphically deciding that intelligence is only in us. But if you look at the definition of intelligence, that's from dictionary.com. I looked at five dictionaries and not one definition of intelligence had the word human in it. Whales are intelligent. Dolphins are intelligent. Somebody in this room has said, my pet's intelligent. The universe is intelligent. So, so everything is intelligent. So why do we call this artificial? It's intelligence, folks. So please use the word technological intelligence. So it's a human-initiated, technologically enhanced intelligence that in partnership creates the next level of intelligence. It's not either or, but in partnership. will transform most aspects of economics and will usher in the next level of human evolution. Anybody read Dan Brown's book, Origins? Raise your hand. Remember the end of that book? 
I believe that's the future. Charles Darwin published Origin of Species, 1859. And he noted in that that the 5,000 years prior to that, there was an acceleration in evolution. Why? Because the creation of civilization. Language, learning, laws, commerce. Evolutionary biologists today say we've easily replicated in the 160 years since then, that 5,000 years. We're 20% heavier, 50% taller, our brains are larger. So I fully believe, standing here in 2020, that whether it's 2050 or 2060, and depending on whether we successfully face climate change, that we will have that same amount of evolutionary step in the merger of humanity and technology between now and 2050 and 2060. So it's our next evolutionary step. The old religions ultimately this century will decline and decline and decline because there's going to be this new consciousness of, of merging of humanity and technology. So now, back in 2003, when we realized we were having a data explosion, there was this analysis as what's the total amount of data that humans have created since the dawn of man? And it was 3 to 12 exabytes of data. Big range, because that's really kind of a stupid specious evaluation. An exabyte is 1 million terabytes. In 2010, we were generating 3 exabytes every 4 days. As of now, in 2014, we're doing it daily. So all of the history programs about the, since the dawn of man to 2003, all of that data is being replicated in a few hours now because of the, the, the explosion of big data. Think about how that might change history, teaching, right? So think about that explosion. Now, and maybe we'll get this to work. Um, so a zettabyte is 1,000 exabytes, okay? So, so a zettabyte is way more than all of humanity has ever created up to now. So what you're going to see in the upper right hand, you're, okay, it's not working, let's see, hold on. In the upper right corner, you're going to see a number, and that's zettabytes that was created in the year that a red line stops in each one of these. I did this chart with a Ringling computer animator in 2012. I think it's a third to 50% conservative. Let's see if we get it to go. It's not playing, um, Darren. Can you give it a try? Okay, it's not. So the point is, in 2010, we created 7.5 zettabytes of data. In 2040, 12,000. I don't even know what the rate of increase is in that. I think it's probably 15 or 18,000. So in 30 years, we've gone from 7.5 zettabytes of data created in a year to 15,000. So transformable technology at the right time will impact every business and life sector, not either or, but incompatible. Poffler, best quote. I've ever seen, I put it in every presentation. When asked about the future of education, he said the illiterate of the 21st century would not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I'm an aging baby boomer. When I graduated from college, I was told, you might have more than one job or career in your lifetime. Why? Because baby boomer parents basically had the same job their entire lifetime. Graduates of colleges today and I think I may have said this when uh, um, Dr. P invited me to, to speak at their uh, commencement uh, in 2014, that um, you're going to have three to five careers in your lifetime, two to three, which have yet to be invented. So how can college possibly prepare anybody for a career, right? Graduates today, I'll say it again, you're going to three, have three to five careers in your lifetime, two or three of which have yet to be invented. That's a big challenge for education, right? But the key word when I talk to CEOs is the word unlearn. And for institutional educators as well. I say to CEOs, the single most important verb you're going to have to master in the 2020s is unlearn what you know so you can relearn what you need to know to stay in the game. 
But Toffler, my summary of this, is lifelong learning has now become the most important aspect of education. We've gone from a knowledge economy to a learning economy. You saw the explosion of data. So, so the point is that, is, that, is that we have to unlearn. What is it we've all learned about education? Time to unlearn it. What have we learned about manufacturing? Time to unlearn it. Additive manufacturing. Whatever it is. Unlearn is a verb we all have to master in your personal lives as well. Just remember this. Arthur C. Clarke, 1950s. The goal of the future is full unemployment. A more significant one for our country right now is from Bertrand Russell. He said it about 20, 100 years ago. To be able to fill leisure intelligently is the last product of a civilization. We're a mature civilization. Leisure right now is defined as, so what do you do when you're not working? Oh, I watch all the ads that make me buy stuff so I have to work so I can, right? whatever that is. So what is the concept of living a full life in leisure? Right now, remember, suspend what you think reality is. So leisure is a not working definition to you. What if it's a full-time occupation of your life? So that's what we have to think about. In other words, I know this guy down here, but if I were to meet this guy, um, you know, at a conference, I'd go, hi, my name's David. And what would you say? My name is David, too. What would be the next question I might ask him? Anybody? What do you do? What do you do? That's going to be a relevant question to a significant part of the population in 10 years. You know, Andrew Yang's talking about universal basic income. Absolutely right. But there's a whole, we need to reinvent and reconstruct our tax code, how we think about economics to empower people. In other words, we will have a choice. This is the canary in the mind that I live. We are either going to have 20, 30, 40 percent unemployment in this country by 2025. Oh my God, 24. Or we're going to say, how do we hunt the greatest unleashing of human potential in human history, where people aren't defined by what they have to do? That's the next evolutionary step. Bear with me. So how do we educate and prepare people for full-time leisure? If we're not thinking about that, we're not skating to where the puck's going to be. We're trying to chase the puck where it is. Think about that. Up to 2000, all history was defined by where you were in the, what cog you were in the economic machine. If we reinvent this and we let, in, the, the greatest study, the most source study is 2013 Oxford. 2013 Oxford said 47% of all the jobs in the United States of America as of 2013 will be gone by 2030. A lot of people see robots in manufacturing plants. The top two white collar professions that anywhere, that study in 2013 um, are accountants and attorneys. 47, 55, 45 percent gone, right? There won't be any paralegals. There won't be any associates. It'll be anything that is redundant, anything you have to do more than once. You know, you buy a house, basically it's the same contract except the specifics of the location. Or you need to fill out a will. Here's all the stuff the state of Florida got to tack on to it. It's all known. So anything repetitive technology we'll be able to handle. That's simple. So why should we do it? We should liberate ourselves to be creative, to invent, to move forward, to serve the common good. So how do we educate? So technological intelligence accelerates, enlarges deeper and faster analysis. What took a week can be done in a day. Golden age of neuroscience. The brain becomes known. I've been tracking this. It's amazing. All my life, you could say, we've learned more in the last 10 years of neuroscience than the entire history before. Now we're in the golden age of neuroscience. It's we, are, we have finally figured out how memory works. I'll get to that. Computing gets redesigned. Quantum and parallel. 
Moore's Law, we all know that, right? Oh, is Moore's Law slowing down? No, the projections are when artificial intelligence, technological intelligence combines with computers, it's going to accelerate by 10,000 times. So we're about ready to have Moore's Law be old history relative to the speed. And we don't know what quantum and parallel computing looks like, but we based the, the ones and the zeros in the 50s based on how we thought the mind worked. Now that we know that the mind works differently, that's going to lead to the reinvention and reimplementation of whole new computing systems that are much more like the mind, which is still the fastest computer on the planet. External plugins and internal plants. They can externally treat schizophrenia. It's not the electric shock therapy of the old, but it's precisely into the right place at the right re um, vibration. Internal plants. I talked about um, Parkinson's. So we all talk about smartphones, smart doorbells, right? So that implies that everything before it was dumb, right? So now we're moving to smart. We're going to move to intelligent universe, environments, where our environment is intelligent. Anybody, raise your hand if you make lists in this room. Pretty much everybody, right? That's the externalization of the mind. You've taken something in your mind and you've put it on a piece of paper. The most important list, therefore, is what you do before you go to bed, right? Oh, I got, I got to write down everything I need to do tomorrow so I can get out of my mind and go and fall asleep, right? This is the ultimate externalization of the mind. I don't know my son's phone number. Does anybody know? No, I just pressed Christopher. What's his number? Oh, I'm not sure, right? I put my mind here. So increasingly, why do we have to fill the mind when the screen reality has the answer? I look at Google more, for, you know, is that person still alive? No, I'll check, right? I look at Google five or 10 times a day, partly because of the, of the what's real going on in the world today. I'll check it, right? So this is the externalization of the mind. So what educations, educators need to figure out is why are we focusing on the mind when all of us are offloading our minds. <laughs> everywhere intelligence will open the door to everywhere consciousness. So if everything is intelligent and connected, it starts to bring about a technologically connected consciousness. And that, as you will see, is going to happen soon. So 2025, 2020 to 2025, Market penetration of 5G 2021. Now some of these points are going to be market penetration and others are going to be when it's first going to happen. Market penetration is the only thing I look at because if there's a single light bulb and then 100,000 people have light bulbs, it doesn't change how humans live until you get to 10 to 20 percent penetration of humans, right? So in this country, we're about a year and a half away not the bogus 5G that Verizon says they have, but 5G. 5G is 100 times faster than 4G. Two hour high def movie download, five seconds. Now, the last few books I've written, I've decided I'm not going to listen to that old b BS of scholarly, oh, you can't source the internet. You have to go to the scholarly things. How about what used to be called the Encyclopedia Britannica. Is that okay? Because the Encyclopedia Britannica could be downloaded on my phone in five or 10 seconds. So is that okay? That I get the Encyclopedia on my phone and source it? And it's online, right? So what 5G is gonna do, it's gonna blow everything up in terms of information availability and simultaneity. Market penetration of audio, I mean of augmented reality, same. Of course, gaming leads the way. We saw what happened a couple years ago. There are people are walking into you know, places they shouldn't walk in and walk in front of cars because they're seeing the augmented reality. I went, the first time I saw augmented reality as a futurist, I basically said to myself, school trips are gonna change. I remember in the fifth grade going, oh, hi, the sweet old lady. Let me take you around and that's great. But if I have the glasses, I'm going to get the physical reality and the screen reality at the same time. So I'm going to hear, oh, like 
I love art museums. I got my degree in art history. I'll go to an art museum with augmented reality. I'll be able to look at Jackson Pollock, and I understand Jackson Pollock, a lot of people don't, but I'll get the augmented reality of where this fits in his life when he painted it and what his emotional state was when he was doing it, right? So think about how augmented reality can change education on field trips. That's, I mean, that's what comes to, came to mind for me. Embedded memory chips. Aging baby boomers stay healthy, right? I've been researching this, and the general consensus is we're learning enough about how memory, it's multiple parts of the brain, memory works. So we will be able, let me simplify it. By 2022, we'll have the beginning of a technological solution to Alzheimer's. Oh, gee, all this Alzheimer's research we're doing, canvas bag, right? So think about that. That's the first time it's going to be implanted around then. How's that going to affect education? I know how it's going to affect a lot of us in this room, right? But, but think about that. Short-term memory, long-term memory? Virtual reality 2025, it's going to take a little longer. Virtual reality, raise your hands if you've ever had a virtual reality goggle on. Didn't it seem real? Yeah. When you give somebody a whole new reality, we aren't even aware as to how that might change. We've gone from physical to screen to totally immersive. Gamers are leading the way, so it's a lot of gamification, which is interesting. But the point is, um, and Stephen High, who's on our board and is not here today, brought me in to speak to all these um, presidents, heads of um, art museums of the Southeast because of this statement I made to him. I said, I have been to the Louvre probably 10 times. So that means I've seen the Mona Lisa 10 times. When I first went in the 60s, I could walk right into the Louvre anytime, no line, and walk up and I could watch, I could look at her tomorrow and there are five people in the room. You go to the Mona Lisa now and it's 500 people taking selfies, largely Chinese, who are saying, oh, trophy. Stephen, what's a better way to appreciate the Mona Lisa? to go there physically and elbow my way up, or to put on a virtual reality tour of the museum in high def and it's only me. Think about that, right? Or the one place that as soon as I get to, I relax, is this condo I have on the beach or this cabin I have in the woods. Put on the VR when you get home from work and in half an hour you're de-stressed. How will this affect education? I'm not an educator, I'm asking you to answer that question. Market penetration of brainwave computer for interface, 2025. By 2025, 2030, there'll be students in colleges who will be typing or will be, it won't be voice, it'll just be, you know, if this, if this was loaded, I'd say next bullet point, I'd think it and it would come up in the screen. Market penetration, 2025. So 2025, 2030, this gets weird. This first one, when I first saw it, I'm a futurist, I couldn't believe it. Early upstart related from, from memory, from uploading it to the cloud. So now we've implanted it, now we know the history, so it's technologically in, it's available for uploading. Which means that in the 2030s and 2040s, your grandchildren will be able to experience the memory of your life. That's 10 years away from being first done. How does that affect education? <laughs> I mean, you know, it blows my mind. First upload of human consciousness to the cloud. Think about that. So we're gonna have the, the 10 years ago, I was talking about cloud, people go, what are you talking about? Oh, it's great. It's all up there. I can access the world and it's all up there. Human consciousness is going to start to get connected in the cloud. Global connected consciousness. When I started as a futurist in 2006, I named my blog Evolution Shift because I believe that the shift age, which will, will exit at the end of this decade, is the transition between a physical, singular, uh, 
consciousness and a globally connected one. If you think about these, the generations I put up, the, the baby boom generation is the last fully place-based generation. Gen X, a little bit more. Um, millennials, digital natives, all connected consciousness, right? So think about that. So I just want to end here by thanking the Sarasota Institute Advisory Board who supported me to be up in this stage and is really happy that this is the first one that you've attended. I want to thank Bob Leonard Research who's done all the research for me and was the co-author of my last book. And again, most importantly, I want to thank the State College of Florida for allowing us to be here. Thank you.